Oh yes! I was hoping that going live would work and it did so Instagram fixed their bug which is awesome so let's see who shows up live um, the only thing is I you know reminded you guys that I was going live today but Instagram was down all day so we'll see who shows up oh hey guys so I'm glad you guys showed up because I was uh, worried that Instagram went down today and there would be no live oh hey guys so I'm gonna just wait for everyone to join. Um, you guys can start asking questions whenever you want. Um, sorry, it's just been kind of a lazy day. I'm not like dressed up for, for Instagram. Um, but yeah, I, how have you guys been? I, I miss Instagram. I have not been on here in a while. I mean, I guess I did my story yesterday, but um, it's it's been like a nice little week long break, and I have been tired just like working on fully nourished and you know keeping clients happy and um, emails and it's just you know it's been it's been a week, but I'm glad to be back. I am really excited to get to your guys' questions. Um, I know that a few of you had questions in the DMs, and I just said like, hey, do you mind asking your questions in in my live so that you know everyone can benefit from the answer. Okay, so Kareen is asking your thoughts on muscle testing. Okay, so this is kind of interesting because I will preface this by saying that I'm not super well versed in muscle testing. It's not something that I've taken. It's not something that I've really dove into. But my experience with it is, uh, I guess like I'm I'm less than thrilled with it. Um, I've had a lot of clients come to me who have spent thousands of dollars on muscle testing. And the practitioners that do muscle testing a lot of times are just prescribing supplements based on what the muscle test is is saying and so a lot of times what's happening is they go for a muscle test you know whatever time of the week they re return you know a week or two later and they're getting prescribed a whole new round of supplements and you know it's based on mineral levels and this and that and I'm like okay you know like I am a very open-minded person and I'm very much like believe that there's not there's things about the body that we just don't understand but I've never had somebody be like wow muscle testing has just been like a lifesaver for me. It's really gotten to the bottom of my issues. It's been kind of one of those things where a lot of my clients have just really chased rabbit trails um, or people that I've met that think muscle testing has really like healed them and then we dig into their issues and I'm like, really? Um, that's interesting to me. So honestly, I think I would never discount someone's story if they said like muscle testing has really worked for me. I just in my experience have really only been like really underwhelmed by it. But that again is just based on what I've seen in my opinion. So I could be completely wrong and it could be 100% accurate. But like I said, it is very expensive and it, it doesn't really like have a, a, it doesn't like make sense to me. Like when somebody sits me down and explains why it works, I'm just like, it doesn't like make sense on a biological level. Like I'm not understanding. Um, low DHEA and low morning cortisol. Been on spironolactone five years. Any thoughts on why low DHEA? Yeah, I mean, um, it it could have something to do with the spironolactone. Could have nothing to do with the spironolactone. It's it's really hard to know. Um, I don't know if that's what you're kind of asking. Is like is the spironolactone um, responsible for it? Can be. Um, a lot of people who are on any type of diuretic. Are flushing minerals. Keep in mind that spironolactone is a potassium sparing diuretic, but it still is flushing out everything else. And so keep in mind that what's really important for adrenal health in general, and keep in mind your adrenals make DHEA, make cortisol, make aldosterone, and uh, they make pregnenolone as well. And so um, if you have low DHEA and low morning cortisol, this is showing a few different things. It could be that you are just stressed out the fasting that happens during the night keep in mind you guys that when you're sleeping and you are metabolically unstable your body has to eventually switch over to using cortisol to make fuel if your liver can't sustain you through the night keep in mind that when you're fasting it is your liver's job to make sure blood glucose levels stay stable and like i talk about here a lot 
nobody has a healthy liver. So um, if your liver is unstable, which most women's are, you can't really sustain an all night fast. And so a lot of times we'll find that women are waking up with really low cortisol. And why is that? Well, they already had their cortisol spike at 1 a.m., 2 a.m. So they had shitty sleep. And then they also woke up and by that time, their cortisol was already in the trash can. And so a lot of times just adding a bedtime snack in right before you go to bed. And even if you wake up in the middle of the night and drinking like some orange juice mixed with some collagen, some protein and some carb, can actually help you have a really a much better morning cortisol reading. And you'll find that reflected in taking your temperatures and pulses. So you'll find that, wow, I'm waking up with a lot less stress. I'm feeling a lot more energized throughout my day. And that will eventually translate into better DHEA levels. Now, if you've kind of dialed in everything, you're eating regularly, you're really supporting stress with food. Whenever I say stress, I'm just meaning like cortisol, um, adrenaline, stress hormones, um, that you have, you can manipulate eating enough and using the right nutrients. But if you are doing everything in your, I guess, energy or your power to lower stress and you're still seeing low DHEA and that's correlating with the medication that you're taking, regardless of what it is, you always do want to ask yourself what I wonder if this medication is affecting my body in this way it's causing stress in some way and we know that a diuretic that's going to flush minerals specifically salt magnesium calcium is going to be incredibly stressful on the body in some way if you're not replenishing those minerals this is why i get really like you guys know i speak out against a keto diet not because i'm like just anti-keto i was keto for so long and i've worked with a lot of women who were on low carb and keto and i've just seen similar situations you know cortisol in the trash can low progesterone low dha high dha just lots of signs of stress because keto really does force you to burn through minerals quickly and you're not replenishing them in in the way of fre fresh ripe fruit um you know a lot of people aren't doing like mineral broths or bone broths they're not drinking coconut water or orange juice and we have to remember that you know when people are encouraging us to eat like our ancestors we don't live like our ancestors. We live in a really, really stressful world. And so why why do should we expect ourselves to eat like our ancestors if we don't even live like our ancestors? And so, you know, this is a long story to say, there's probably some stress there. If you're waking up with low cortisol and you're waking up with low DHEA, you're having low DHEA across the board, there's a problem there. There's a stress issue and you kind of have to get to the bottom of it. Is it just the fact that your liver's not sustaining you through the night and you need something as simple as a bedtime snack and more frequent eating? Or or is it something more in depth like the medication you're taking and those are questions you kind of have to ask yourself and I always say why don't you try the first you know the easiest changes first and then if those don't work you can kind of start to to boil it down to hmm I wonder if it is the medication I'm taking but um, it is possible for sure um, could you please speak on why a body may not handle exercise well? I miss it so much, but for years, whenever I start exercising, my body swells up like it's under massive stress. Yeah, this is actually very common with hormonal imbalances. So you guys have to understand that exercise um, does release endotoxins in the gut. So it actually, um, I guess, riles, we can, this is a simplified way to say it, but it riles up bacteria in the gut. And keep in mind that bacteria themselves are not bad. We talk about fungus and candida and all these things, and people are like, oh my God, these bacteria and funguses are so bad. I'm like, they're really not bad in themselves. Um, it's what they create, those endotoxins or LPS called lipopolysaccharides, inflammatory chemicals that get into the bloodstream and burden the liver and end up causing systemic inflammation. They, they inflame the cells, cause insulin resistance, right? And so you're seeing that when you work out and you're seeing inflammation, you are seeing the results of either one, endotoxins, the bacteria is getting riled up, two, estrogen. So keep in mind when this bacteria is riled up you're not going to be detoxifying estrogen well and remember the gallbladder dumps bile into the small intestine and bile is the carrier for estrogen so that's how your body's moving estrogen out of the body dumps it from the bile into the small intestine the small intestine carries it out into the large intestine and then we want it to get out but if that if all this bacteria is dysbiotic and imbalanced or that process is not happening correctly we can get a lot of recirculation of estrogen which, which is going to honestly guys make us just sick and fat like it, it just makes you fat and it makes you inflamed it makes you puffy and it just makes you not feel good and so that's usually the biggest reasons i find this is very common like anytime an endurance runner or triathlon like a triathlete comes to me Nine times out of 10, this is their problem. They have like severe issues with endotoxins and estrogen, which gets released while you're exercising hardcore. 
but it could also be cortisol. You're just not recovering well because it's such a stressor on your already stressed out body. So you have to ask yourself a few things. You have to ask yourself if you are really being very consistent about eating very regularly. With exercise comes responsibility. And so if you have really wrecked hormones, you do need to make sure you, you take some time. Sometimes it takes like four to six weeks to really make a note and a point to nourish yourself. Every three hours on the dot, having a meal that has protein, carb and fat. A lot of people are on low carb diets without even knowing it. They're eating under 100 grams of carbs and so their body's in this weird, weird, I said weird ass. I'm trying not to cuss. I know I cuss a lot and it's just because I'm a stressed out person and it like releases tension. Um, so, you know, you're, you need to understand that if your hormones are imbalanced, you need carbohydrates. And if you don't have them, you will see you might not see that you don't feel good until your body's under stress, whether it's pressure from the outside world, whether it's pressure from exercise, whether it's stress from relationships, whether it's stress from uh, a job, you will start to break under stress. It's not like people are always like, oh, I feel great, like low carb, or I, I don't eat a lot of carbs, I don't need a lot of carbs, I'm super sensitive to sugar. And I'm like, well then what the heck is your body burning? Because it's, it's if it doesn't have enough glucose, it's gonna make its own. And so this is where women are, I call it starvation syndrome. Syndrome. They're not eating enough carbs to fuel their everyday activities, but they're not eating enough they're not in ketosis, so their body's not quite burning fat. Their body's switching from glucose to fat to glucose to fat all the time, which is not good. I know we think like burning fat is good because of what's going on, the fad dieting right now, ketosis, but ketosis in itself is just so funny to me that people are thinking it's a good thing. It's not good. Um, so uh, we need to make sure, first of all, when we're exercising, that we are getting enough carbohydrates, period, done, end of story. A lot of healthy women can tolerate a ton more carbohydrates and they're eating. And then we need to make sure that we're eating frequently, especially if we're trying to recover from stress. When it comes to exercise, more is not better. A lot of us are like, go hard or go home, right? We, we go from working out zero days a week to lifting, you know, 90 minutes a day. And you can't do that. I always say you gotta start with maybe one or two strength training workouts a week. The rest in between matters. So I say start with three rest days in between, then work down to two then work down to one, and that might be over the course of three months. And the way that you know your body's starting to tolerate exercise better is by using your temperatures and pulse. And so you need to experiment with duration, you need to experiment with rest in between sets. So say you're lifting, you're doing deadlifts, you might need to take five to 10 minutes instead of two minutes like you've been taking. So really try to rest more in between sets, try to sh do shorter, more effective workouts, and do them less frequently. And then in between working out, Find other ways to move your body. Walking, Pilates, stretching, get moving without actually like pushing yourself or exerting yourself. All the while working on healing your body. So eating frequently, getting enough electrolytes, getting enough carbohydrates, specifically in the form of fruit and fruit juices. I know like we're supposed to be afraid of fruit or whatever, but keep in mind guys that starches and grain starches, especially when they're not cooked or prepared properly, are what make us fat. Fruit and fruit juices, when combined with protein and uh, fat, do not make us fat. They are like lean machines. And also, you know, sometimes women are eating things that are inflaming them and not realizing it. And these are not like, I call them hidden inflammatory foods because there's all these like people are like, you know, dairy's inflammatory, gluten's inflammatory. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, you know, if we're going to talk about inflammatory foods, some of them are pounding raw green vegetables, pounding nuts and seeds because they cut out dairy. So they're eating tons of like nut milk and nut cheeses and all this like ugh, fermentable carbohydrates and their gut bacteria is just going nuts. And so they see that expressed when they go to work out. They're seeing inflammation being expressed. That doesn't mean that the workout itself is making you inflamed. It's like kind of, think about like when dust kind of settles to the bottom of like a water bottle. You put dirt in a water bottle and it settles to the bottom and then you go work out and that's like shaking up the bottle. And so you're seeing all the dust and you're like, oh my God, like it's dirty. And I'm like, no, it's always been that way. You're just finally seeing it for what it is. And so, 
I would really focus four to six weeks on lowering stress using food, rest, self-care, detoxification, like sweating in a in detox bath, going to saunas, walking, moving your body, stretching, but not exerting yourself. And then when you go back to working out, don't go hard or go home. Start with one or two workouts a week with lots of rest in between both your sets and your actual workouts themselves and find your exercise tolerance. Really work up from, from a small amount and work up. Another way that you can really help lower stress during a workout is by drinking something that has sugar and some protein before a workout, while you're working out, and after you work out. Something as simple as I just do orange juice with collagen, um, or I'll do, uh, I'll do orange juice with collagen before a workout and orange juice with collagen after a workout, and then I'll drink coconut water while I'm working out. And you can drink the orange juice, collagen, while you're working out if you want to. You're just pretty much trying to get minerals and carbohydrates and protein into your body before and after a workout to really lower the stress response. Because keep in mind, you guys, when you're under, you're exerting yourself, your body needs fuel, not less fuel, more fuel. A lot of us like seem to think our body runs on thin air or something, and our body does not do that. It needs fuel. And so if you're not consuming the fuel, or your body is very used to breaking down its own tissues for fuel using cortisol, it will very quickly switch over into a tissue burning mode or a high cortisol mode. And so the way that we manually keep cortisol levels down is we use sugar, we use salt, and we use protein, baby. And that is how you hack your hormones. If you don't want your exercise to stress you the hell out, don't do it fasted and make sure you're sipping on sugar while you do it and watch your abs start to pop watch you get lean and mean you will begin to see like wow you start to see a very very easy correlation between when i do not consume sugar i have like almost like a low grade anxiety i don't recover well my muscles are a lot more sore because you're it's not just the carbohydrates the, the sugar is an adaptogen in itself but it's the minerals that come with those carbohydrates the magnesium and the potassium and the calcium that's gonna help you your body kind of have what it needs so it doesn't have to make what it needs. I know that was a long answer for a simple question, but it's it takes a little bit of getting to the bottom of why you're not recovering from exercise. And sometimes it, it takes completely cutting exercise out and then slowly and gradually working it in once you've kind of gotten your stress levels low. Also thoughts on taking collagen peptides as a supplement. So collagen peptides is really interesting to me. Like I know Vital Proteins is pretty expensive, but I actually use that very therapeutically in my practice. So I don't believe in protein powders. I think they're kind of stupid and junky and they're processed food. Like let's just be, just be honest. However, I do think there's a lot of merit to gelatinous foods, specifically bone broth, gelatin, and collagen, which you'll see does play a starring role in my online program, Fully Nourished. Um, and I have you use collagen instead of protein powder in protein shakes and um, smoothies and um there's a reason for it. It's very rich in an amino acid called glycine. Glycine is very restorative to the liver. The liver needs glycine to work optimally. And a lot of us are eating high diets and muscle meats, right? We're eating lots of steak, lots of grass-fed beef, chicken, which is fine. However, we need to remember that our ancestors have adapted to eating nose to tail, eating the whole animal. And they actually used to feed their muscle meats to their dogs because they thought that was like the grossest part of the animal. And so we are eating these really high methionine um, meats and that is actually depleting us of glycine, that amino acid that our liver needs to balance itself out. This is why, you know, the vegan community believes that meat is acidic because muscle meats are acidic and they need to be balanced out with gelatinous foods, bone broth, collagen, gelatin. So that's a long way of saying I love collagen peptides. They do need to be processed the right way. So some companies are kind of coming onto the market and they're like, oh, look at my collagen. It's so cheap. But you have to understand that when you take gelatin and break it down so that it no longer gelatinizes, you can actually create MSG in that process. And it's not their fault. It's just the processing part of protein like MSG or mono sodium glutamate is a protein that excites the brain. And so sometimes when you heat protein or you break down the bonds in a, in a in improper way, you create MSG in the process. So I like Vital Proteins is a great brand and I like Great Lakes. Those are the two brands that I trust that work really, really well. I know they're a little bit more on the pricey side as compared to maybe some brands you'll come across, but there's a reason for that. They process their amino acids properly. But I love collagen and I lean on it very heavily 
as a protein powder and as a healing food. Can you give a quick recap on cycling progesterone cream day after ovulation through bleed? Yes. So you can kind of hack this, you guys. Like I obviously, you guys, I'm just going to be honest with you. When I'm on Instagram or I'm on social media or even when I'm working with clients, I have to be very careful. Like I can't just say like you need to do this because first of all, that does you a disservice. Like I want you to kind of experiment so you find your sweet spot. I promise you it, it won't hurt you. The only thing that too much progesterone does really is make you so sleepy and lazy. Like it makes you just chillaxed. So you'll be like, wow. I took too much. Um, but you kind of have to figure out what works for you. There are women that, so you have to understand why you're taking progesterone. Progesterone is very anti-inflammatory. It's very anti-stress. And so sometimes you have so such horrible symptoms that you need to supplement pro progesterone all cycle long, but you don't want to cycle the same amount all cycle long. So you would, you would, um, supplement a small dose the first half of your cycle and then you would raise the dose from day 14 up until your bleed like you said so usually when you're supplementing progesterone you want to mimic your natural cycle which would be you make you make progesterone when you ovulate and you make it all the way up until you bleed so it's typically women ovulate around day 14 if you're not ovulating then you just start on day 14 sometimes supplementing progesterone before you ovulate so let's say you ovulate day 18 and you start on day 14 your body can sometimes get a little confused and it can actually stop you from ovulating but this happens very rarely and as long as you're not like tra actively trying to get pregnant if you are then you need to wait until you ovulate and then start supplementing progesterone just to make sure that it's not stopping you from ovulating but Usually it doesn't stop you from ovulating. If anything, it makes your next cycle's ovulation come back stronger and better because it's so anti-inflammatory and so anti-stress, which are both gonna support a healthy ovulation. So yes, you take it from day 14, all the way up until your bleed. Now, if you're the type of woman, some women, progesterone can actually prolong them from bleeding. And so if that's the case, if you stop your progesterone, it will bring on your period. So just know that in the natural cycle, when your progesterone levels start to drop, your corpus luteum gets reabsorbed, your progesterone levels will drop and that brings on your period, that brings on your bleed. So yeah, 14 days 14 to 28 for most women. If you wanna like get you know down and dirty with it, you can wait until after you ovulate and take it all the way up until you menstruate. But overall, pretty much from ovulation up until menstruation is how you do progesterone. Um, oh, Kayreen said she had done muscle testing in the past and lots of supplements. Yeah, you know, I feel you and like you guys, I do not think that's, eh, a lot of practitioners are supplement pushers these days. It's just like, oh, you have this, take this supplement. I'm like, what's the difference between that and prescribing a medication for an issue? There are time and there's a time and a place for supplements, but they need to be used as tools and seen as tools. A lot of times, even in practitioners that I love and respect, they're being used as crutches. They're being used as medication almost. And I'm like, no, you have to, they supplement. They supplement an already awesome rock solid nutrition routine and lifestyle routine they do not come in first and foremost and um do you know they, they shouldn't be leaned on as the whole part of your protocol where can you use magnesium oil spray for best results okay so you can actually use it all over your body i sometimes people get really itchy from it just because like it's reacting with their skin so if that's the case you can just mix it with a little coconut oil and it should absorb fine i use it all over my body except for my face obviously like ugh, it like would itch my face um but i use it all over my body but the best if you just want to maybe use it like in, in a few little areas i really love applying it over my my liver which is like under that right rib cage and over my pancreas which is under that left rib cage so kind of just on my torso and my abdomen but I I like using it all over because the more surface area that is covered the better it the better it is um, the more that will get absorbed what are good foods for low progesterone? Mm, so coconut oil is incredible for low progesterone. So is like all those really healthy saturated fats like ghee and grass-fed butter and, and grass-fed beef tallow. I love bone broth because we're looking, you know, when we have low progesterone, there's so many possible factors that, be, that could be causing low progesterone. And so we have to, that's really what we're trying to feed when we're eating a food for raising progesterone. We're trying to lower inflammation. We're trying to support the thyroid. We're, we're trying to 
get the stress levels down. And so the way that we really support stress is by getting adequate levels of minerals. We need to make sure we're getting high quality sea salt liberally. If you are craving salty foods, girl, you are not getting enough salt. You need to not crave salt anymore. You need to salt your food until it it should like any more salt and it would be too salty. That's that's where the, the proper salt amount is. Just because we live in such a stressful environment, we're just we're just going through minerals so dang quickly. And then when it comes to potassium, that's why I'm like I'm you know, I call myself an OJ pusher because I'm like orange juice is a really great place to get potassium and it also has vitamin C, which is very supportive of the adrenal glands and it helps you utilize progesterone better. It's like nature's woman's food. And so OJ and coconut oil are my top favorites for getting potassium. Potassium, and then you got to make sure you're getting magnesium. So magnesium rich foods are going to be cooked greens, uh, cacao powder, um, chocolate, coffee. Those are going to be really rich in magnesium. And then calcium, which is really huge. And a lot of women who are cutting dairy, they lose their cycles or they stop ovulating or they get low progesterone without realizing it because calcium is so important for gut health. It's actually a really amazing prebiotic that helps change the environment of the bacteria, which supports inflammation. But then we also have calcium is very supportive to mineral overall electrolyte balance and a mineral balance. And unless you're like consuming raw greens like it's your job or cooked greens or greens broths like it's your job, you're probably not getting enough calcium if you're not doing high quality dairy, even if it's in the form of like Parmesan cheese and some like sharp hard cheddar. You know, you got to get some kind of calcium in there. So that's to lower stress, those minerals. And then we want to make sure that we're supporting inflammation. So bone broth, collagen, incredible for lowering inflammation in the body. Um, if you're pooping out any vegetables, meaning that they're not, they're going through your whole digestive tract undigested, then those need to not be eaten any longer until you can digest them again, because that's causing, I mean, think about like a, a piece of kale just rubbing against the delicate skin of your intestines, just like, you know, it's just not good for inflammation levels. And then, you know, on the flip side, we also need to make sure we're supporting our thyroid. And the way that we do that is protein. So protein is prothyroid and low protein diets actually cause thyroid issues or slow metabolism. So we need to make sure we're getting enough protein balanced with carbs and fat. You know, we don't want to eat protein alone because it drops our blood sugar too low, but we want to make sure we're getting enough protein. That's why I always recommend collagen and bone broth and getting lots of um, healthy proteins in, in the form of eggs or dairy, or even like high quality meats and organ meats. Um, and then we want to make sure we're eating frequently every three, four hours tops. A lot of women need like every two to three hours when they're first starting their metabolic or hormonal healing journey. And then they can kind of start pushing their meal times a little further. Um, but they have to go by their hunger and, and their, um, uh, their uh, like portion size. So you wanna eat just enough to where you're able to go about three hours without getting hangry, but you also don't wanna eat too much to where you, you have to push your meal times five or six hours. Any recommendations to add to nighttime routine if cortisol is elevating just before bedtime? Yes, so if you do dairy, grandma's milk is my favorite. It's, it's a recipe in Fully Nourished. I keep pointing backwards because my computer's right there and I'm like working on Fully Nourished. Um, so grandma's milk is my favorite. It's just a cup of warm milk, whether that's goat's milk, sheep's milk, or just regular uh, cow's milk. Of course, I love high quality. If it's raw, it's even better, but whatever you prefer, or you could just do coconut milk. It just, the reason why I recommend milk is because it is rich in casein and whey, which are two proteins that are anti-stress. They calm the stress response. They immediately lower cortisol. You'll see that directly reflect, reflected in your temperatures and pulse right away when you are drinking some, some milk. Um, so warm it up and then add a, like about a teaspoon to a tablespoon of raw honey or coconut sugar. And just a little bit of sugar is going to help nourish the, the liver and help carry you through the night. And you'll find you're waking up a lot more rested. You're getting a lot better sleep. You probably have better progesterone levels as well. And so remember, you guys, when I recommend sugar or really healthy carbohydrates, you'll, you'll notice that I always recommend them in conjunction with protein and fat for a reason. We want to slow the digestion. We don't want to just like pound sugar. We want to make sure it's combined with protein and carb or protein and fat to, to help us um, tolerate it better and digest it better. And so a, a cup of whole milk has protein and fat. And then you're adding a little bit of sugar in the form of honey and coconut sugar and it's going to calm you down. But I would do that or just do any type of bedtime snack that's small and has some carb and fat. So like 
like half a sweet potato with some grass-fed butter and cinnamon, um, a handful of berries with some homemade, just, you know, two tablespoons of some whipped cream or heavy cream over frozen berries is great. Um, I sometimes will do like an organic rice cake with a fourth of uh, an avocado kind of mashed on top. So I'll just choose a carb and um, a, some type of fat and you just want it to be small. Like you don't want a big meal to where you can't sleep well. The goal is just to kind of give yourself nourishment, chew it really well, swallow it, and then go, go to bed, you know, within about 30 minutes. How can I increase my vitamin D levels? I was told not to expose myself to the sun because I have rosacea. Yeah, so a, another way to increase, if, if you can't for medical reasons, um, get vitamin D exposure, then probably the best would be to supplement. Um, I think that liquid under the tongue supplements are so much better than capsule supplements. And I, you know, I talk about this pretty regularly is the additives and fillers and supplements can sometimes cause more harm than good. And a lot of women who are on stacks and stacks of supplements that are like, I have no idea why I'm on this. They go off of everything. They're like, wow, like I feel so much better. And I'm like how long has it been since you haven't been on supplements and they're like like years and I'm like oh my gosh so I prefer anything that's going to be under the tongue or topically absorbed and um, I like Carlson's brand of vitamin D for an under the tongue uh vitamin D supplement. Hey Jess, I recently got my period and it only lasted for 1.5 days. I usually have a three to four day period. Should I be concerned? Um, I think it's always about kind of just paying attention, which is you are doing the, the perfect thing. You're just acknowledging that something might not be right, but that doesn't mean like we should stress about it. Like, oh no, no, it could have just been a freak incident. Keep in mind that when you get a weird period you always want to look back to two weeks what happened two weeks before because that's when ovulation occurred and that is really what matters and in your case maybe ovulation didn't occur but uh, a, a short period that's very very light can sometimes indicate low estrogen or it can indicate um that you didn't even ovulate that could be another thing is that you maybe just had an anovulatory cycle but that can happen for even a healthy woman and so just pay attention look maybe towards the next cycle and see if it goes back to normal especially if you had a stressful maybe month this month or there was some you know maybe extra drinking or lack of sleep around ovulation time and it might have caused you to not ovulate any type of stressor but you do want to keep an eye on it and that's kind of the thing is like you don't want to obsess about it but if this becomes a pattern then there might be something off and that like anytime it becomes a pattern that's when you really want to um, dial it in and see what's going on I was just telling my bestie about you and that your info is the opposite of everything I've been doing over 10 years. I'm feeling so much better lately. Thank you. You're welcome. I think sometimes I feel really discouraged because I'm on here and I know that people enjoy the information, but sometimes I get like worried, you know, because it's like so contrary to what everyone says, but I know it's science, you know, like I look at the science and that's why I'm so dedicated to you guys. And I'm like, so just like laser focused, but it can be really hard when like every colleague and every other person in your industry is teaching something completely different. It's hard to find, you know, like a common ground with people. Um, so for me, it's like, I sometimes where I'm like, I hope, you know, like, oh no, like maybe I am wrong. You know, it makes you like second guess yourself sometimes. And I'm like, no, this is science. Like, Duh. Like I'm looking at the research right now and I know this is true. It's true for me. It's true for every woman I've worked with and it's true for you guys too. And it helps me so much when you guys share your stories and you guys say like, hey, just want to let you know what you're saying is really making me feel better. It makes me like so happy. So I'm so happy that you are feeling better because I think sometimes we get used to like feeling like crap and we don't even recognize that it's small habits that we've picked up over the years that have just been like ingrained into us by people who didn't even know what they were talking talking about in the first place. I think the biggest one for me is um, drinking a gallon of water every day. I was like in the fitness community. I was a personal trainer before I got into what I'm doing now. And I was like always drinking like a gallon of water or like so much water every single day. Like maybe not a gallon, but so much water. And I thought like for sure that was like a foundational thing for health. And I just remember like always feeling like crap. And I thought, you know, maybe it's heavy metals and maybe it's mold. And like I ran all these tests and I'm like, what the heck is wrong with me? And then I like realized like I came across a few articles and started like digging into the science be be uh, behind hyperhydration, which is overhydrating yourself. And I was like, Maybe I'm doing that. And I like just started drinking water when I was thirsty. And within a week, I was like, I feel great. 
like, what an idiot, you know, like all I had to do was freaking listen to my body. And here I am like taking all this outside information. And so I've had so many like aha moments like that. And I want you guys to have all these aha moments as well because I think it's just like it's common sense but then it's like I don't know is it you know because we've been told such such contrary things and there's so many people right now like especially right now with keto being so big and low carb like everywhere you look everyone is like low carb keto which is a very symptom suppressing diet so I want you guys to be aware that yes the first year or so you feel great you feel awesome you're like oh I'm lean I'm mean like oof like I'm so good except you did go through that keto flu and you have anxiety but no like that's not a that's not a big deal like I feel great right I'm lean I lost 10 pounds or 15 pounds right and then all of a sudden at that like year mark you're just your hair just starts like whoosh, falling out in chunks you have like all that you can't focus you you have like you know chronic anxiety you're like what's going on and it's because this this diet that made you think that, oh, I'm good, right? Everything's good. And I'm like, well, you can only run on stress for so long. And then eventually your body starts to just break down in front of you. You'll start to age quickly. You'll start to see like you look like you're literally eating yourself alive because you are. <laughs> Is it okay to drink coconut water on its own or should it be consumed with a protein and fat? You guys, like I always say protein and fat because like a lot of us struggle with blood sugar imbalances and insulin resistance and so in those cases you do want to be more conscious of balancing your meals but for someone that is lean or metabolically stable, which I know you are, girl, um, coconut water is fine on its own and it's really not that high in sugar and we have to keep in mind that potassium acts very much like insulin and allows sugar into the cells. And so potassium rich foods can sometimes be fine to just eat on their own, even if they're technically high in sugar or carbohydrates, because even though the ingredient label or, you know, that label says like, oh, 10 grams of sugar, how do we know that that sugar is being, you know, broken down in the same way that that other sugar is being broken down? And so usually coconut water is fine on its own, especially during a workout. Difference between fresh squeezed OJ and just eating an orange. Thank you. Yeah, so it's when, the reason why I pr promote fresh squeezed orange juice is because fresh squeezed orange juice allows you to get a lot of the nutrients without having to digest the pith or the fiber in oranges, which for people that are really, really, um, I guess, um, metabolically unstable they mo mostly have gut issues their gut their ear their guts are irritated or inflamed and the pulp or the fiber in that orange i mean you would have to eat like 10 oranges to get the same amount that you would squeeze into a glass of orange juice and so like eating 10 oranges would wreck your digestive system just wreck it and so i always say like it orange juice should be treated as a therapeutic food um and you can eat, totally eat some oranges too. There's no problem problem with it. I just think like it's a orange juice is a way smoother and, and more refreshing way to get all of those anti-inflammatory chemicals, specifically naringin and naringenin, into your body quickly without causing any intestinal irritation. So sometimes fibers can cause issues. You know, there's all these people out there doing juice cleanses and this and that, and, you're, and, and you might know like, okay, that doesn't really work in theory, but you have to ask yourself, why are these people feeling so good when they're on this juice cleanse or this ju juice fast? And it's because they are not having to digest any fiber at all. And so it's similar. Like, I think that women should be really conscious of, you know, and I'm not like anti-fiber, but there are specific fibers that can be really irritating. And so eating too many oranges could probably irritate you. Um, that doesn't mean oranges are bad, but you're not going to sit there and eat like 10 in one sitting. So you could totally eat oranges, but also utilize orange juice as a therapeutic food. Um, fresh squeezed orange juice, there's just nothing like it. Think of it as like a, a, a easily digested elixir that's just potently anti-inflammatory and it doesn't cause any irritation unless there's pulp or um, pith in it because your body actually now has to digest it. So for people that have really robust digestive systems and they're fine, um, they can sometimes eat a lot of oranges, but there's nothing like fresh squeezed orange juice and it can be used therapeutically. Like it's really good for before a workout and the sugar that's actually quick absorbing and digesting is the, the point of orange juice. I know a lot of people are like, oh, you want to consume it with the fiber? And I'm like, well, you know, I always say like combine your orange juice with 
uh, a meal that has protein and fat or combine it with some milk inside of it or a little bit of cream and some salt and some collagen to balance it out. But it is a quick and easy, easily digested sugar, which is the point. We want to be able to utilize energy quickly and efficiently. Is eating oranges the same as drinking the orange juice? Like I just said, no, um, they're both beneficial, just different. And I think it's it, they both have their application. Collagen hydroxylate from Great Lakes, green canister, okay? Yes, yep. So I like having both on hand. Um, in Fully Nourished, there's a few recipes that require the red can, and then there's a lot that require the green can. So like if you're making jellies, I really like to stew watermelon, so I'll just put a bunch of like watermelon in a little pan, and then I'll warm it up, get it all warm, put in jello or gelatin, and then I'll pour it into molds and make some jello really quickly. You can also do that with coconut water, you can do it with orange juice. Like it's just a really easy snack. I find that's really fun to snack on it's really delicious it kind of tastes like you can add like sour things and it can taste like sour gummies almost sometimes i'll even be like a little naughty and i'll like um roll them in some organic cane sugar to make like little sour patch children because i'm just like a little rebel like that and i like sour patch so i gotta make my own so honestly i like having both on hand but for like every day day-to-day -day basis you'll probably end up using the collagen hydroxylate way more than gelatin what do you think about advice that you shouldn't eat certain food groups together because of differences in digestion time? For example, fruit digests quicker than meat and shouldn't be eaten together. Yeah, you know, it's one of those things where I haven't seen any relevance to it. Like for most of my clients and myself, combining foods does nothing for them. You know, it's like, and so I always say like if a health habit does not add joy to your life and it doesn't bring you a sense of well-being or help you in any way, why the hell stick to it? It's so complicated. You're like, oh my God, like I'm eating fruit with my meat. Like, oh God. And it's like, what the heck? Like eat it. Um, our digestive system should be robust enough to handle it. Now, if you do notice like, wow, I really eat you know, fruit and meat together and it just really bothers me, then maybe snack on your fruit while you're preparing your meal and then have your meal separately because fruit does digest quickly. It, it digests in about 30 minutes. So it, it's a, a quick digesting food, um, but it doesn't necessarily have to be eaten alone unless you truly find benefit from doing that. I personally don't find benefit from doing that and many people I know don't find benefit from doing that. What do you consider to be a healthy transit time? How much activated charcoal should I take to test transit time? Thank you. Anything under 24 hours. So you kind of want, I mean, the quicker the better. You obviously don't want diarrhea. That's, that's a different thing. But you want your body to quickly extract nutrients, digest things, break them down, and get them out as quickly as possible to remove dead bacteria, endotoxins, and waste. And so anything under 24 hours is good. Um, but it, it kind of is just going to, depend on you, your body, what you ate, all of those things, but about 24 hours is good or less. And then um, for activated charcoal, you don't need much to, to, to make it black. So um, I would say about a teaspoon or so. Um, you can do less, like a fourth a teaspoon, a half a teaspoon. Um, as a note on activated charcoal, you guys, I actually recommend taking activated charcoal like once a weekish or so, especially around ovulation, like right before when your estrogen is at its highest and a couple days before your period when all your hormones are at their highest. The reason for this is it can just bind and absorb to estrogens. It, it binds and absorbs to literally everything. So don't take it next to a medication or a supplement and it can actually really help lower estrogen levels in the body and endotoxins and so this can actually be utilized after certain workouts as well like if you're feeling kind of shitty after a workout um, you can maybe see if that activated charcoal helps you and that could show you that oh there's a lot of toxins coming from my gut if activated charcoal makes you feel better that is toxins coming from your gut and that's proving to you like yep I've got some toxins going on there. But yeah, you don't need much to test your transit time. You'll see it for sure. Stopped birth control and getting the craziest amount of hair loss. Is this the androgen rebound? Anything I can do to make it less awful or do I need to just wait it out? So it just kind of depends how long it's been. Um, usually that first three to six months is like hell on earth. Um, but for people that have hair loss that runs in the family, sometimes it's just like never stops. So you have to actually get to the bottom of what what's causing it, which is usually low progesterone. 
progesterone's like that, you know, pro hair, skin and nail hormone. And, you know, we want to make sure we're having enough. And keep in mind that after birth control, you, you were getting some benefits because the fake progesterone or progestins in the pill do have some benefit. This is why some women are like, oh my God, I look so beautiful on the pill. And then I'm like, not anymore. And I'm like, well, there were certain benefits of progestins that had certain attributes of progesterone, but they weren't providing you the same benefit that progesterone does. So I always say you got to start when you quit the pill, start tracking your ovulation. You want to make sure you go back to ovulating within three months so you can start making progesterone. And around that six month mark, you'll start to see like, okay, things are going back to normal. But if that doesn't happen, sometimes supplementing bioidentical progesterone can be helpful or kind of maybe digging into the issue. Like, is there gut issues going on? Is the liver kind of burdened? But yeah, that three to six months after birth control is like kind of wonky um, for a lot of women. So it's hard to know um, what's going on, but you, you do want to make sure you're sleeping, you're resting. I do bone broth every single day to really support inflammation and support the liver. Um, you want to make sure that you're, I would do chlorophyll every day to really support the liver um, and just kind of like get things back to normal. And then you just want to make sure you're sweating, you're exercising, you're getting sun, you're just taking care of yourself eating normally, regularly, keeping blood sugar balanced, and your body can usually do the rest as long as you're getting the nutrients you need in into your body. Um, but yeah, like I, there's not like one specific thing that I can name that's gonna make hair loss specifically better. It's just kind of one of those things where figuring out like why it's happening, is it stress, is it low progesterone? It could be both, um, but the three to six months following the pill, it, it does. Like acne gets worse, hair loss gets worse. It really like depends on what you struggled with pre-pill, it's gonna get, you know, pretty bad post-pill. Um, but yeah, mostly just supporting your body and really lowering stress is gonna be the number one thing. Um, sometimes people are like, dim works or saw palmetto works. I'm like, me, neutral on those herbs. Um, Vitex can sometimes work, but I, I always say like it's best to let the body balance itself as much as possible post pill because sometimes when you get hooked on something like Vitex or some other herb, then you're kind of reliant on it. Like when you start to go off of it, you see your symptoms return. And so it's best to just really support your body and make sure you're getting enough minerals, make sure you're eating regularly, you're sleeping, you're exercising, you're sweating, you're just kind of taking care of yourself. Um, and if it doesn't stop though, like at that three to six month mark and it's getting worse, that's when you really want to be like, okay, what's going on? What are my cortisol levels? What are my progesterone levels? Am I ovulating? Those are kind of the three things I would ask about hair loss. How can I manage a new diagnosis of PCOS without medication that the doctor recommended? I feel like the only symptoms I have of PCOS is highly irregular periods, no extra hair growth, weight, etc. Yeah. So, you know, honestly, your goal is to get your ovulation back. And a lot of women who get diagnosed with PCOS actually get, and I'm not saying that this is the case for you, I've seen so many women get misdiagnosed. They've gotten misdiagnosed. The most common misdiagnosis is after pill. So post pill PCOS, they are getting symptoms of PCOS, but it's actually post pill. Um, that's the first thing. I've also seen women get diagnosed with PCOS when they actually have hypothyroidism. They didn't get their thyroid levels checked, a full thyroid panel that includes free T3, and that can prevent you from ovulating regularly. Keep in mind that when your periods are irregular, it's not your periods that are irregular. It's your ovulation that's irregular. And that's going to lead to a progesterone deficiency, which is going to cause inflammation in the body. And so if indeed you're having an ovulation problem, your goal is to get to the bottom of what is the stressor that's driving that that in, infrequent or irregular ovulation. And you, you got to start digging in, you know, what's going on during your follicular phase that's causing stress? Are you drinking too much? Are you not sleeping? Are you exercising too hard? Are you under eating? Are you not eating frequently enough? Are you not taking care of your body? Are you in a stressful environment, whether that's relationship or toxic work environment, um, or in a stressful place with school, whatever it is, you kind of have to start digging in why what's holding me back from ovulating and making my body feel safe enough to reproduce that's really what's going on with irregular periods and in your case like you know a lot of people go on medications because they have symptoms that are just really they want to get under control even if it's just slapping a band-aid but for you it's like you know why would you go on that if you have no symptoms you're trying to control um 
something as simple as inositol can really help bring back a regular period or a regular cycle. So just understand that you have options, not saying that medication isn't the best option. You know, you have to trust your gut on that and do your own research. But I think sometimes we can be made to feel, especially if we get a PCOS diagnosis, especially in this like weird social media culture where now like everyone's talking about PCOS, that like you need to constantly be obsessed with like the fact that you have PCOS. And I'm like, no, you need to live your life. You need to treat your body well and you need to trust that your body is going to do its thing in its due time. Um, and, uh, you know, guys, I've had PCOS, like I've known I had PCOS for almost 10 years now. And, uh, yeah, I, I had a hard time losing weight at first. I had a hard time figuring everything out, but now I, I've done all the fad diets. I've done all the things that, you know, you're supposed to do. And I got sick and tired of it because it didn't really make me feel better. And so now I just eat balanced meals. I take care of myself. I do things I enjoy. You know, I enjoy strength training. It gives me metabolic stability. When you build more muscle, it does make you more sensitive to glucose. Coast, you can uptake more carbohydrates. Um, I sleep well. I prioritize my sleep. I make sure that I say no more often now. I, you know, don't take too much on, even though I'm still me. Um, so it, it's kind of one of those things where you got to learn to live with it and you have to really find a sustainable way of going about it. And you can really li live with PCOS symptom free as long as you get your periods back to being regular. And that sometimes takes diving into the stressors that are holding you back from ovulating. Do you like the D3 plus K2 by Carlson? Is K2 important for D3 absorption? Yes. So I do like um, the combined ones, especially if you're not getting enough K2. A lot of us are, I guess like if we're doing greens and we're getting like high quality dairy and um, some grass fed beef liver in pretty regularly, we're getting enough K. But there are other things that can deplete us of K and keep in mind that our bacteria make us K. And so sometimes our bacteria can be really imbalanced and so we're not making enough K. But overall, supplementing with K2 can be really helpful for the gut. And I don't see a problem with doing the D3 plus K2. It, K2 is helpful for absorption of, of D3 and calcium. So um, there's nothing wrong with supplementing K2. That's exactly what happened to me on keto. The weight loss was not worth it at all. Yeah, girl, I know. I personally got like hideous digestive issues and I didn't really notice how bad they got until I went back to eating carbohydrates and I was like whoa this is not normal like I can't digest literally anything this is like a horrible state of being so it really like showed me what uh, it does to your digestive tract and now there are studies coming out that showing that keto makes your liver insulin resistant so a keto can actually make us more insulin resistant and on top of it, it can also uh, completely destroy the balance of bacteria in our gut. So it completely starves certain strains of bacteria that are actually incredibly beneficial to our overall health as a human being. And uh, so when we go back to eating carbs, then it's like, oh my gosh, like we really start to see that this overgrowth of bad bacteria has occurred. You mentioned oranges a lot for potassium. How do you feel about bananas? Okay, so bananas can actually be kind of allergenic, which is why I don't recommend them a ton because they're really rich in starches. And a lot of women, like, so the reason why I suggest a lot of fruit is because it's high in fructose and it's a sugar that kind of, um, I get, it doesn't spike blood sugar as much. So that's why I recommend fruit, but bananas are kind of the exception. They're more starchy than they are fruit. Now, if you wait for them to ripen completely to where they're brown, they're spotty, they actually are ripe, they're more, um, they have more sugar in them. But before they're ripe, they're more starch and they can really feed bacteria. And so I'm not against bananas for sure. Like to have a banana if you love bananas, but I wouldn't be pounding bananas, um, especially if you have gut issues or um, you have like an, you're very sensitive. A lot of times they can be pretty irritating. So and the reason for this is not necessarily that bananas are bad. It's just how we produce them in our society, in our culture, like they're always picked unripe and allowed to ripen or they're sprayed with ripening gas and I know it's just awful like it makes me sick but this is kind of how they do things and so it's hard to find a banana that's like vine or um tree ripened like your your uh, your bananas are being ripened chemically and so they can kind of be irritating but I'm not against them they are rich in potassium for sure um I just wouldn't like go crazy with bananas all the time do you have a stance on drinking water with food or waiting until after? I do have a stance on that. And yeah, I definitely do not recommend drinking a bunch of water with your food. It's one of the worst habits that you can have. It first of all, like wrecks your digestion. And second of all, it just makes you super freaking bloated. Like I'm like, I don't know how people can do it. Now it is a 
very bad habit to break. A lot of people just chug water with their food. And I think it's partially because people are not chewing their food well. Like you should be very chewing very mindfully and carefully and, and, and combining your saliva with your foods until it's liquid and then swallow it. But a lot of people are just like, you know, chomping down and chewing just enough to like swallow a big chunk of food down their throat, which bacteria are gonna go ham on. And then they have to like chug water. So if you're trying to break that habit, um, I recommend like just having a small cup of water, warm water or ginger tea with your meal and just sipping when necessary. No chugging, no gulping, just sipping. And it might take like two to three weeks to break the habit, but once you do, you'll find that you digest a lot better. Now, of course, if you're thirsty, drink, but a lot of people are like chugging water out of habit um, and it does dilute your stomach acid and your digestive enzymes and it just makes your food uh, not digest as well and there's a lot of water in our food especially if we're eating like water rich um, fruits and vegetables and meats and broths and milk and things like that what foods do you recommend for improving gut health? Just came off taking antibiotics. Yeah, um, so I just kind of recommend staying away from like ex grain starches and bean starches for a while. They can kind of like really proliferate the bad bacteria. Um, but I just, you know, calcium rich foods, getting enough greens in as long as you can digest them. Um, even doing some natural probiotics, whether you kind of make your own like kvass or kefir or buy one store bought, just make sure it's high quality. Um, you don't need to like excessively consume probiotics after a round of antibiotics though. Uh, that's actually a mistaken belief and it can actually prevent your gut from rebalancing itself. So just make sure you're eating well, you're taking care of yourself. You're, the bacteria in your gut will do the work for you. Um, they are hard at work proliferating themselves. Um, a raw carrot can be really beneficial at kind of like keeping the balance good while you're recovering from antibiotics and I do that pretty regularly with my clients. But over Overall, um, a lot of times antibiotics, like especially if you're not doing them chronically and you're kind of doing them maybe like under once a year or so, can actually be pretty beneficial. I've seen so many people have like hideous digestive problems and then they go on a round of antibiotics for like whatever, an ear infection, and they're like, my gut is better. And I'm like, yeah, because that's bacteria at work. So I wouldn't worry too much. I think there's a lot of like antibiotic like stress and I'm like, yeah, chronic use of antibiotics can really be bad on the body. But a round of antibiotics here and there can sometimes just wipe bad strains of bacteria out that need to go. Hi Jess, super pumped for Fully Nourished. Been living with PCOS and embarrassing hirsutism for so long. No insulin resistance, not overweight. Do you see women who really can stop these symptoms? Yes, it can take time. But um, as a tip, when you guys have hirsutism, if you want to quicken up the process, because sometimes hirsutism can take a while to recover from. Like it wasn't one of my main symptoms, but it is something I struggled with, especially I had like the happy trail on my belly, which was kind of embarrassing for me. Um, and in between my, my breasts, which was like, I don't know, it's just kind of like not a place where you want hair, obviously, as a woman. But I only had peach fuzz on my face. And even though I had like a peach fuzz beard, I know that that is like nothing compared to what some women struggle with. But I did, you know, over the years, I have noticed that my hair has gotten way different. I My peach fuzz has really gone. My in between the breast hairs are gone and I might have one or two black coarse hairs pop up on my, near my belly button when I'm stressed which shows like hmm what's going on when I'm stressed but I've had a, some women see a lot of success applying progesterone topically to their um, to their hair um, especially if it's on their face I recommend getting like an oil um, Ona's progesterone oil or a progest e can be a better option but you can find creams as well I just sometimes the creams have a lot of ingredients that can irritate the facial skin but that doesn't mean you can't try it and progesterone directly affects, you know, high DHEA, high androgens, high estrogen, which can be very powerful. So it, it is definitely worth a try, and I think it can really quicken up the process because hirsutism does take time to improve for sure. I've seen it improve, absolutely, but sometimes it does take, you know, a year, two years. It can, and it will gradually improve over time, but obviously, like, we're the type of people who's like, I want it gone, and I want it gone now, and anything in between is like, no, like, I want it gone and it's like well we need to remember like it took us a while to get to this point and it's gonna like kind of be slow getting back but as long as it's improving over time that's a good thing but I think progesterone applied topically can be a really really um, beneficial a complement to lowering stress inside of the body uh, that it's just very anti-androgenic so that can be uh, something 
How did you know you needed to take bioidentical progesterone? My diet changes have lengthened my luteal phase from 14 to 15 to 16 days, but I still sometimes get tender breasts before a period. Yeah, so for me, headaches, um, I get like any estrogen dominant symptom. So um, clots, headaches, uh, tender breasts, like you just said, um, breakouts and overall just not feeling good like the couple days leading up to my cycle I really want to feel invincible during my luteal phase and not like oh I'm just like struggling to get by like I hope I get to my period but overall I test my progesterone levels um, that's the best way to go about knowing if you need progesterone or not is just testing them but I know it's not an option for everyone so in that case it's kind of one of those things where well you you either have to choose to experiment based kind of go in blind and not really know where your levels are um, based on symptoms I mean if you're still having estrogen dominant symptoms and it's kind of like uh you know what could hurt and then the worst thing that can happen is you can see extreme estrogen dominant symptoms because a lot of women when they start supplementing progesterone they think oh my gosh i'm reacting poorly to the progesterone because they start to see really um bad cycles and really like tender breasts like all of a sudden their symptoms are getting worse not better and they're like oh my god the progesterone like wrecked me and i'm like no the progesterone mobilizes estrogen and so you probably are now seeing the effects the actual effects of the amount of estrogen that's present in your body um so sometimes adding progesterone into the picture can actually like bring you what you didn't want like you're like wait i thought this was supposed to make you me better but you're mobilizing estrogen so it's one of those things where i don't think it's really that dangerous to supplement with but it's a good idea to get tested and work with a practitioner if you can what are your best exercises to help with PCOS symptoms? Okay, so Instagram's cutting me off. They're giving me 20 more seconds. So I'm gonna pause on that question and I'm gonna go live again right now. And if you guys wanna join me again, I'll start with that question. And then if I didn't get to any of the other questions, just ask me again and I'll get through them as quickly as possible.